Welcome back. In Book 6 of the Aeneid, we really see Aeneas fulfilling a lot of the requirements of the hero pattern and looking a bit more like Odysseus in the Odyssey. So let's start this lecture with a part that I like to call Aeneid Book 6, the Catabasis of Aeneas. The first requirement of the hero pattern in Book 6 that Aeneas fulfills is that he gets the help of a supernatural agent, and boy does he get the help of a supernatural agent. He gets the help of the Sibyl, who's the priestess of Apollo. He gets the help of Apollo himself when Apollo comes down and inhabits the Sibyl and speaks prophecy through her. And finally, he's going to get the help of all of the inhabitants of the underworld, it seems, as well as his father, Anchises, who died in Book 3. So Aeneas will get help here, and we'll talk more about what this means in a minute. He also travels to the land of the dead, where he gains valuable knowledge about what lies ahead. And this episode where he talks to his father is meant to echo the episode in the Odyssey where Odysseus talks to the prophet Tiresias. Uh, and we'll talk about the difference between these two passages later as well. Finally, he'll return to the world of a living. He'll return home, but not to the old home he knew, like Odysseus in the Odyssey, but to a new home. So in each of these instances, Virgil will refer to an earlier text, uh, be it the Iliad or the Odyssey, but he'll put his own spin on the episode. And even as you're thinking about the older story, then there will be some dissonance between that and the new story. And this is what intertextuality is all about, where by creating tension between the story you already know and the new story, Virgil is shaping the way you think about the new story as well and doing something interesting with it that's also quite new. So let's talk about what Aeneas does. Um, after Aeneas leaves Carthage and leaves the suicidal Dido, uh, he actually sails back to Sicily. And I cut out this portion of the reading because um, I personally think that Book 5 is a little boring and it doesn't really add much to the story. After Book 5, Aeneas will sail to Cumae, which is here in Italy, uh, in the southern part of the Italy near the Bay of Naples. Cumae is where this episode of the story takes place. Uh, if you want to know more about Cumae, I'll tell you this. Cumae is the site of an actual temple of Apollo. In fact, the ruins of the temple of Apollo that you're looking at in this picture were ruins of a temple to Apollo built by Augustus around the time Virgil was writing this poem, and they were built on the foundations of a much, much older temple to Apollo at Cumae. Why is that important here? It's important here because Apollo is the god of prophecy, and whose help do you need to seek when you're looking for prophecy? Apollo is, of course. When Aeneas comes to the temple of Apollo at Cumae, we learn that the temple was built by Daedalus, uh, an engineer who worked at the court of the king of Knossos. And there's an interesting story here. There are several interesting stories that branch out of this. So I'll tackle a couple of them so that we know these before we enter this story. The first is the story of how Daedalus came to build the labyrinth on Knossos Crete. So let's talk about that. Um, the labyrinth, the story of the labyrinth is a very old one. How did there come to be a labyrinth? Let's talk about it. King Minos of Crete employed Daedalus as a court engineer in his kingdom of Knossos. King Minos was given a, a gift by the god Poseidon, but failed to thank the god properly for this. We know what happens when we don't know ourselves, right? If you don't, if you don't make a proper sacrifice to the gods, bad things will happen to you. Poseidon, being angry at Minos for what he had or hadn't done, did the following thing. He cursed his wife, Pasiphae, to fall in love with a bull. So, Pasiphae came to Daedalus, the court engineer, and asked him to make a cow costume for her so she could seduce the bull. Daedalus complied and built her a cow costume, which is what you're looking at in this slide right here. Pasiphae was successful in seducing the bull, and the result of this was this. A man with the head of a bull who eats humans, and the name of that is the Minotaur. Now, why does the Minotaur seem to be trapped in a maze here? Because after the Minotaur was born, this product of interspecies love, Minos didn't have the heart to destroy it. So, partially is repayment for the help that Daedalus had given his wife, and partially so that the thing could be walled up and no one would ever see it again, he had Daedalus build a maze 
to contain the Minotaur. Later on, in an athletic competition in Athens, Minos' son, not the Minotaur, would die in an athletic competition during an accident. And as a result of this, he forced the Athenians to send him a certain number of young people every year to be sent into the maze as a human sacrifice to the Minotaur. He also imprisoned Daedalus and his son Icarus in the maze. As time went by, eventually a hero rose up who could defeat the Minotaur. His name was Theseus. Meanwhile, Daedalus and his son Icarus just wanted to escape. So with Daedalus's engineering skills, they made wings. The only problem with the design of these wings was the availability of good products from wing making. And the wings were actually held together by, amongst other things, wax. Daedalus only gave his son a few instructions as they were beginning to fly out of the maze. The first of these was, don't fly too high, because if you fly too close to the sun, the wax will melt, and you'll fall to the sea. Don't fly too low, the wings will get heavy with the moisture from the water, and you'll sink into the sea. Follow the middle course, stay with me. So he's asking his son to be obedient and stick with him. Of course, what does Icarus do? He flies too close to the sun, and as we can see in this image, the wax melts and the feathers start falling off the wings and he falls into the sea. And Bruegel famously paints this into his landscape with the fall of Icarus, or Icarus falls to the sea. And in this image we can actually see Icarus's pathetic little feet wiggling out of the sea as the farmer passes by, seemingly unaware that a human has just fallen out of the sky. Well, Daedalus had escaped, but he had lost his son in the process. He came to the land of Cumae, built this temple and dedicated it to Apollo, and never did much engineering again. Why do you think that in a story about Aeneas going to visit his dead father in the underworld, Virgil would choose, would choose to insert into the narrative a story about parental anxiety? Well, uh, in the stories, there's a bit of parallel narrative going on in these stories. In one, Father and son go up into the air, and another, both father and son, will go deep beneath the earth. In one, the father will give his son advice, and the other, the father will give his son advice. I guess what we're meant to think of as we think of this story, remember, more intertextuality here, I guess what we're meant to think of is the anxiety that a father has for his son, and his wish to pass on advice to him that will keep him safe. So Aeneas goes to the entrance of the temple and it leads back into a cave where the Sibyl, a priestess who follows Apollo, gives him a prophecy. And how does this work? She actually lets the spirit of Apollo fill her until she is horribly deformed. Uh, here's an image of her made by Michelangelo. She tells Aeneas that he'll have to fight more wars and bad things will happen. She also instructs him that if he wants to see his father, remember, this is Aeneas' idea, unlike in the Odyssey where it was Circe's idea, Aeneas must go out into the woods and pluck a golden bough from a tree. If you're wondering what a golden bough is, it's just a fancy word for branch. Aeneas has to go out into the woods nearby in Avernus and collect a golden branch that's, glowing, that's growing from a regular tree. And this will be his price of admission into the underworld. So he does a bunch of sacrifices and ends up in the underworld. And he'll see all kinds of people down there as he goes in with the Sibyl. Um, he'll see his dead lover, Dido. Uh, and also in the underworld, we get a more complete vision of the ancient idea of, the, of afterlife. The Greek idea is just a bunch of spirits floating around in a gray area. But we can see in the Roman version, there's actually quite a bit more stratification to this. Um, there are the places where sinners go. There are the places where heroes go. There are the places where suicides go. There are the places where dead infants go. There are the places where super centers go. Um, and this was indeed Dante's inspiration for his Inferno. And probably also for this reason that Dante's guide in the Inferno is none other than one Virgil. Finally, the Sibyl leads Aeneas to his father, who is, who is living in the Elysian fields. And his father has some advice for him. And this is where this poem departs from the Odyssey. He doesn't just tell Aeneas what's coming ahead. He tells Aeneas who he is. And this is kind of the crux of the poem here, so pay attention. His father says, 
near the end of, of book six. Others, I have no doubt, will forge the bronze to breathe with suppler lines, draw from the block of marble, features quick with life, plead their cases better, chart the, with rods the stars that climb the sky and foretell the times they rise. But you, Roman, remember, rule with all your power the peoples of the earth. These will be your arts, to put your stamp on the works and ways of peace, to spare the defeated, and to break the proud in war. So this is the point. Um, Aeneas gets his marching orders. He learns not what to do, but what to be. And I want you to remember these last words, spare the defeated and break the proud in war, especially as we go into the later books of the Aeneid. Um, and this advice does, at first doesn't seem terribly practical, but if it's telling us who to be, then it's useful for our people who have lost their country, isn't it? Also notice that it's the first time in the story that Aeneas has been referred to as a Roman, even though there's not a Rome yet. There are a couple of other features about this that are a little bit odd. Um, while we get what seems at first to be propaganda on Virgil's part in Anchises' description of the famous future Romans who were just waiting to be born, who were hanging out in the Elysian fields in the underworld, there are also some parts of this book that are problematic. If you think that this is only a book about, uh, about saying Romans are the best. Um, my first observation on this is that when Aeneas goes to pick the Golden Bough and get his entrance into the underworld, um, Sybil is quick to tell him that if it, the bow doesn't give way right away, he's not destined to go to the underworld. And Aeneas indeed has some trouble pulling the bow off the tree. It doesn't exactly give away easily. Uh, perhaps this is meant to be foreshadowing in that he will get what he wants, but it'll be tough to do so. Or maybe it means that things won't work out the way they're destined. It's hard to say. Uh, the second part of this that's a little problematic for us as readers is the fact that there are two exits to the underworld. One is the gate of true dreams, and that's made out of horn. The second is the gate of false dreams, and that's made out of ivory. Aeneas walks out of the gate of false dreams. He walks out of the ivory gates. Why that is, I couldn't say. Uh, is it, does it mean that somehow what's been told to him is destined to not come true? Or is there no significance at all? In either event, Virgil chose to put in this part of the story for a reason. So things don't work out for Aeneas in this book the same way they do for Odysseus in the Odyssey. Odysseus comes to learn the way. Aeneas comes to learn the way to be. And, and there's tension between this and the Odyssey. Virgil's doing something different here. Lastly, when Aeneas leaves, he's going to come to Caite, the mouth of the Tiber River. And this is near the site of the future Rome. Aeneas is coming home in a sense, just like all heroes who fulfill the hero pattern. But he's not coming home in the same way Odysseus does. He's not coming home in disguise. He is coming home as a stranger, but in a totally different way. Aeneas will land at a place where his ancestors came from. Remember, the founder of Troy did come from Italy. But he shows up as a refugee, and also looking a bit like a pirate. We'll talk more about that in Book 7. Stay tuned for my le lectures on Books 7 and 8.